We would like to thank Amgen, for providing an unrestricted grant, to support the IACH webinar series. Hi, this is Jello Eastern Dr. Eastern. I am a hematologist and bone marrow transplantation physician at Rush University in Chicago, United States. I'm very happy to present uh, this um, presentation on systemic mastocytosis as an IAHC webinars. The these are my disclosures. I have Honoria from Novartis and Blueprint for advisory boards. So the, my goals are to discuss definition of systemic mastocytosis, clinical forms of SM defined by who, um, discuss the diagnosis of SM progression and the caveats of diagnosis, prognostifications of SM risk factors and new scoring system, and how to manage SM. Starting with the mast cells, mast cells are really interesting cells. I think still mystery for us with um, um, hundreds of granules in their cytoplasm. Uh, they are as other hem hematological cells produced in the bone marrow. However, that's why one of the problems with uh, improvement in um, uh, mast cell science, they hard to find in the peripheral blood as soon as they are made. Uh, they uh, go to the tissues and function there. Uh, they are uh, dependent, their growth and de developments are dependent of stem cell factor or uh, uh, st uh, stem cell factor or stimulation by stimulation of the tyrosine kinase receptor uh, kit. Uh, as they mature, I, as I mentioned, they they have uh, multiple granules in their cytoplasm, including some of them we know, uh, histamine, heparin, uh, proteases, and, and tryptase. Uh, the, the, like I mentioned, the, the function of them is mostly unknown, although it was defined by Professor Paul Elrich one, about 130 years ago. So one of the, there are multiple functions, but I want to just to give a couple of how uh, wide uh, their symptomatology or their his, um, ATU, the uh, clinical physiology will be uh, different and affecting uh, so many disorders. Uh, you see that this is a, um, when I was at the University of Minnesota, one of my colleagues was working on uh, sickle cell pain, and this is a mice model. She showed that mast cells are involved in uh, uh, pain in, uh, induced by sickle cell in these mice. And the second one, well, I was interested in as a transplantation physician, mast cells and, and graft versus host disease. And again, at the University of Minnesota, we were able to show that uh, as great uh, G, grade of GVHD increases, the mast cells uh, in the tissue decreases significantly. This is grade four, hard to see mast cells and grade one mast cells were uh, easily uh, seen in the tissue. Um, and very interestingly, uh, this decrease in the uh, mast cells are also associated with GI tract GVHD staging. And as, as you can see here, these patients' uh, NRM increased uh, with the lower number of um, graph, uh, mast cells. So as you can see, there are really significant function of normal mast cells and we, we have a lot of room to understand what it does. But now I will switch to mastocytosis. What is mastocytosis? It is an, um, uh, characterized by abnormal growth and accumulation of mast cells. And these mast cells are not um, reactive and normal mast cells. They have to be neoplastic 
uh, uh, monocol in nature. The symptoms and signs of mastocytosis come two ways. One is releasing of these chemical mediators that I showed before, or organ infiltration and fibrosis associated with that, and therefore organ dysfunctions and failure. Uh, mastocytosis today, it can be cutaneous mastocytosis, meaning that uh, the patients do not have uh, systemic evidence of mastocytosis only in the skin. There are different types, uh, forms of uh, cutaneous mastocytosis uh, and systemic mastocytosis. Systemic mastocytosis can have skin involvement as well. Uh, this uh, SM uh, they, uh, are, is divided to indolent SM, smoldering SM, aggressive SM, systemic mastocytosis associated with hematological neoplasm and mast cell leukemia. These three, the last three, are, are, are also defined as in uh, advanced uh, systemic mastocytosis. So when I'm talking about cutaneous mastocytosis, it can be seen in two different populations. It can be in pediatric group and their uh, the macular lesions, the size and where it is seen and are uh, quite different. And very interestingly, uh, they are in childhood, it is transient, most of them resolves by itself as uh, the patient um, get older, gets older, but in adults it's chronic it, and almost always associated with systemic mastocytosis. In children, it is only in skin, very unlikely to be involved, uh, to involve in other organs and uh, presented as systemic mastocytosis in contrast to adulthood systemic mastocytosis. So adulthood associated with SM, childhood only cutaneous mastocytosis. And again, in SM, because it is generally associated with SM, uh, cutaneous uh, SM, therefore tryptase generally elevated than 20. In children, it's less than 20. In adults, almost always associated with uh, exon 17 kit mutation, kit D816V. In childhood, there are, um, most of them are not uh, kit D816V mutation, but other exons mutation. So in children and adult cutaneous mastocytosis mean different things. So what is, how do we diagnose SM? Uh, there is a, a very good uh, clear definition by uh, World Health Organization. There is one major criterion and three, uh, four minor criteria this patient needs to have one major plus one minor or three at least three minor criteria if there is no major the major means that there are aggregates of um mass cells and and uh, and generally the number is 15 mass cells in one aggregate so it has to be in um uh uh, in the aggregate, more than 15 mast cells. And obviously, this cannot be in the skin alone. If it is, then it is cutaneous mastocytosis. It has to be extra cutaneous site. Uh, almost always, we go for the bone marrow and we do the bone marrow biopsy. But can it be liver? Yes. It can be another organ? Yes. So it has to be uh, other than skin. Uh, it has to be shown that uh, uh, mast cells in aggregate if if and the minors are these mast cells should be in diff, um, abnormal uh, morphology and generally spindle cell very common more than 25 percent of it they need to express aberrant expression of cd2 and or cd25 um, again kit mutation in adult is almost always uh, kit D816V mutation and tryptase has to be elevated greater than 20. So systemic mastocytosis, um, we, if it is mast cells, this is a bone marrow uh, biopsy and we can now look at the, how do we subtype uh, systemic mastocytosis. Mast cells are less than 20% in aspirate 
or it is more than 20 percent if it is more than 20 percent in bone marrow aspirate then it's called mast cell leukemia if it is less than 20 percent we look at b findings and c findings and depending on c findings c findings meaning that i will go over but all organ dysfunction b findings means that organ is enlarged because of mast cells so if there is a organ dysfunction then it is aggressive systemic mastocytosis if not then we look for b findings if it is organs are enlarged or not if it is yes then it is systemic smoldering systemic mastocytosis if no it is indolent systemic mastocytosis so cis as ahn is associated hematological neoplasm uh this can be mds cmml uh aml mostly vast majority is myeloid if additional associated hematological malignancy uh to uh systemic mastocytosis then it this define it uh systemic mastocytosis with associated hematological neoplasm smahn the in these conditions sm can be indolent or aggressive or in fact mcl can be um so here uh the indolent and smoldering sm i will tell you what are the b findings the b findings are borderline benign meaning that uh, the bone marrow mastocytosis burden is that more than 30 percent tryptase is increased and organs are enlarged like hepatomegaly organomegaly lymphadenopathy but but no uh dysfunction the, the functions are normal if if functions are started if the functions have started worsening then it is c finding for example bone marrow impaired then like cytopenias bone large uh, as osteolytic lesion um gi tract is affected uh and causing diarrhea that is not c finding c finding is weight loss uh the he hepatomegaly hepatomegaly is b finding liver enzymes elevation and hepatomegaly is c finding um same way uh splenomegaly is b finding but portal hypertension aside is hypoalbuminemia is c finding okay so our european colleagues have been uh really uh, fantastic in sm and they developed a uh, registry and you can see here that starting um from early years they now have uh more than 4000 uh mastocytosis patients in the registry this shows us that vast majority of patients will have uh, indolent systemic mastocytosis 60 to 70 percent uh um the cutaneous mastocytosis meaning that the mastocytosis in on the skin 15 percent or so and we look at on the left side these are our advanced group uh systemic mastocytosis with ahn about 10 percent mast cell leukemia is very limited thankfully otherwise it's a poor prognostic disease one percent asm is three percent and smoldering systemic mastocytosis meaning that they have enlarged organs b findings but not advanced sm not aggressive sm uh they their organ functions are normal so why is it important we have to look at this it's important because it affects patients uh, survival and so we can predict uh, their survival by who uh, diagnoses and subtyping so what I will show you here is the Mayo Clinic data. It's a uh, classic now, this uh, publication shows that the red, the indolent SM and blue uh, curve uh, shows that patients age matched healthy uh, people. And we can see the ISM perfectly overlaps with the health match people so their survival the ism patient survival is expected to be normal however they can develop anaphylaxis and perhaps that can threaten their life other than that 
uh, their survival is expected to be normal. However, when we look at the left side, unfortunately, these are the advanced SM group. Their survival is quite dismal. Advan aggressive systemic mastocytosis, systemic mastocytosis with associated hematological malignancy. Their median survival was about um, three to four years. And mast cell leukemia, their uh, median survival was less than one year. This ECNM group uh, also looked at this, and you can see the similar thing. The indolent group is here, and their survival is quite good. But advanced group uh, is uh, at aggressive systemic mastocytosis, mast cell leukemia, SMAHM patients die again, median survival somewhere between uh, one year to uh, four years. Uh, so therefore, very important to classify cystic mastocytosis by for their subtype. So how do we diagnose cystic mastocytosis? Obviously, skin lesions are important, right? The patients can, in fact, uh, notice it and come come to us to say, hey, what is what is this? And most of the uh, skin lesions in adults are uh, urticaria pigmentosa. And it, it's very typical when you see it, you can diagnose it, but it can be in different forms. It can be um, uh, a particular in children can be presented in different ways. Uh, why, what I am showing here that Dr. Hartman presented this in a uh, European um, mast cell meeting 2020, it, Mass urticaria pigmentosa is much more common in indolent forms. When the patients have SMAHN or mast cell, uh, mast cell leukemia or aggressive system mastocytosis, the, the skin lesions decreases, you can see here. So the advanced SM may not have urticaria pigmentosa. Most of the adult patients with indolent SM will have urticaria pigmentosa. A continuing diagnosis, serum tertase is very important. If you are concerned about uh, mastocytosis, please obtain uh, serum tertase. But um, as you see here, serum tertase will be higher in patients with advanced group than uh, indolent group. Indolent group will also have increased um, uh, tryptase levels, but in advanced group tryptase level will be higher. However, keep in mind that uh, the serum tryptase can be elevated in other hematological disorder like uh, chronic myeloid neoplasms, uh, chronic eosinophilic leukemia, or PDGFR um, beta alpha affected diseases. Uh, and not only hematological malignancies, but other um, disorders can also elevate tryptase. Again, important to remember that renal failure increases serum tryptase and parasites can cause increased um, uh, uh, tryptase levels. There is a new entity, uh, very important, and to remember that hereditary alpha tryptasemia, this is a genetic disorder inherited uh, from in the family from parents from one of the parents, and it affects the uh, alpha tryptase encoding TPS uh, alpha beta one. Uh, in this station, alpha uh, increases in, in the uh, tryptase, and tryptase formation changes includes more alpha uh, because of this genetic uh, change. And the phenotype, uh, instead of alpha, 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 beta, 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 it, we will start seeing more alphas, and every inc alpha increase increases serum tryptase levels. So her hereditary alpha tryptasemia increases uh, tryptase levels, and patients will have symptoms, increase vascular leak, increase chance of allergies, anaphylaxis, pruritus, urticaria, connective tissue phenotypes like hypermetabolism. Uh, like ehlers danlos syndrome and GI symptoms, dyspepsia, motility issues. And then another important thing here, if someone has had, doesn't mean that they cannot have SM. They can have SM. In fact, uh, systemic mastocytosis patients can have uh, SM uh, had 
more than a normal controlled po population. And as you see, the Caucasians can have 5% pets. So it's not a, it's not a um, rare disorder. Uh, and we are trying to understand more and more uh, about HAT. Diagnosis, what about kit mutations? And uh, important to re remember that 90% of SM patients in adults should have kit D816V mutation, it's here. But in children, their kit mutation, 30%, only 30% uh, is kit D81V, 30% wild type, and 40% is uh, extracellular domain uh, uh, kit uh, mutations. So, uh, and you remember, pediatrics generally present with cutaneous mastocytosis with no systemic mastocytosis, but uh, adult uh, system almost always has systemic mastocytosis. What about kit mutation and hematological malignancies? More and more, we are uh, under finding that if patient has uh, C myeloid proliferative neoplasm and kit mutation, very likely they have SM2. And the, when the pathologists go back and look at the diagnostic um, bone marrow, they recognize more SM that they missed in the beginning. So here's the, um, the, the um, a study published in 2020 shows very nicely uh, CMML patients, kit positive D816V, almost all of them had uh, um, mast cell disease that it was missed from the beginning. And you can see MDS, MPN patients, and um, some other myeloid disorders. But if, if patient has non-kit mutation, uh, I, I mean, I'm sorry, kit mutation other than D816V, in the uh, uh, in that population, core binding factor positive AML is more common with systemic mastocytosis. How do we? What should we do? Uh, where do we do? Uh, where? Uh, how do we order and and what specimen we should obtain for the accurate diagnosis of SM? Um, Nowadays, a particular European colleagues suggest that if, first of all, we have to use specific, very sensitive uh, uh, tests, and two very sensitive tests. One is allele-specific oligonucleotide qPCR, very sickness. The other one, digital PCR. These two are very, very sensitive, and it, like I said, the uh, European colleagues think that you can order from peripheral blood and even from peripheral blood, it should detect it. And I, I personally started using um, peripheral blood and even patients uh, who had in the past negative kit testing in the bone marrow. Now with this technology from peripheral blood, I, I can get positive results. It's very, um, very useful. And of course, if you are worried about SMAHN, uh, you also want to do uh, NGS for the um, other myeloid uh, mutations. Diagnosis continues, and what, what it is, it can causes bone lesions. Bone lesions can be like myeloma, lytic lesions here in calvarium, or, um, or it can be sclerotic lesions like in the pelvis here. Uh, here is in the uh, vertebra, uh, lumbar sacral vertebra, sclerotic lesions. Sometimes they, these are confused by solid tumor metastases and they biopsy it, thinking that it is maybe prostate cancer. It comes back, it is mast cells. Uh, hepatomegaly, cyclenomegaly are common. Lymphadenopathy is common um, uh, here. And sometimes this they can be positive by PET, uh, MRI, hepatomegaly, and, and increase uh, uh, resistance uh, elast by elastogram, MR elastogram or ultrasound elastogram because of fibrosis uh, in the liver. Uh, and here are the mediastinal lymph nodes.
prognosis. Okay, that we are now we have um, identified good prognostic factors. So here, well, uh, the correlation first. Kit eight one six V mutation allelic burden, and this is prognostic. And you can see here that uh, advanced versus indolent SM are different by um, mast cell infiltration in the bone marrow, different by serum tryptase level in the blood. Dif are, they are different when you look at KIT the 816V mutation in the bone marrow aspirate or in the tissue. So advanced group and ISM will be different in this um uh test uh see that kit d 81 v mutation muted allelic ratio uh, ratios here uh the indolent forms cotenous form indolent form and then ssm increases asm is higher and smh and so this two obviously advances them and and this allelic burden is associated with prognosis if it is less they survive uh, longer because they are in the indolent form. It makes sense. What about bone mineral density? You will notice that this patient's alkaline phosphorase will be increased. And this is a study from Germany uh, presented at the CNM 2020 meeting. You can see here that uh, in indolent forms, mostly osteoporosis, but osteosclerosis is mostly in the advanced group and increase uh, density in bone density. So generally porosis, very common in and indolent forms, um, maybe large lytic lesions and sclerotic lesions are common in the uh, advanced forms. And you can see here that normal bone marrow density survival is great but increased bone marrow density decreases the survival in even uh in advanced sm and indolent sm patients kit uh, d816v mutation is not the only one um the more and more studies show the heterogeneity regarding molecular markers jack2 axl1 run x1 srsf2 TET2 mutations are common and can they affect the outcomes, the survival? Yes, it does. Um, here in indolent cystic mastocytosis, if AXL1, RONX1, DNM, T3A were present, uh, in addition to the beta 2 microglobulin and KIT D816V, VAF1, more than 1%, the survival significantly changed by scoring system, this scoring system. But I will I will like to take uh, attention to here that these extra mutations in indolent SM, thankfully were rare. Um, but if it was present, increase the risk score and the patient's survival decline. What about advanced SM scoring system? Uh, this is uh, German colleagues created this and published in JCO 2019. Uh, four factors, age greater than 60, present, presence of SAR mutation, hemoglobin less than 10, platelets less than 100. What, and they, they grouped this low intermediate high risk score and they can separate patient survival in training and validation uh, group cohorts. And what you can see here on the right hand side, the most common mutations, as I mentioned, TET2, SRFS2, AXL1, RUNX1, JAK2. And these mutations, uh, most uh, the low intermediate high risk scores, uh, the the intermediate and high group mostly consisted by um, consisted of uh, the SMHN group. So SMHN generally, if you see more molecular abnormalities or lower blood counts, it makes sense if there is an associated hematological neoplasm. They they were in the um, they made the uh, 
scoring system go high and the patients generally had intermediate or high score and their survival was lower compared to uh, risk score of uh, low risk score of uh, um, of patients uh, there are other criteria, but we can see the similar factors you can start seeing the similar factors and this is a uh, again indolent group age and alkaline phosphatase was important in advanced group age trip days level in this score was 126 or lower or higher white cells hemoglobin platelets again hemoglobin platelets and age and and the scoring system it's called international prognostic scoring system uh led by dr spur uh shows different differentiated the uh, patient survival very well and the last one came uh, this year they it, it's called global prognostic scoring system for sm and you can notice here again uh, hemoglobin was important, serum alkaline phos phosphatase was important um, uh, for the overall survival and SAR mutation presence or not present was important. And for progression-free survival platelet count, serum baseline triptase level and beta-2 microglobulin, they um, stratify the patients in low risk intermediate group and high risk group and you can see the low risk group enjoy very good almost 100 percent survival intermediate group somewhere around 70 but uh low, high risk group for the eight patients survival was this small how do we treat uh systemic mastocytosis okay that now we have really effective drugs Mitosterin, I want to mention, and it got FDA approval uh, somewhere around uh, five years ago after published uh, New England Journal of Medicine 2016. It was phase two study, uh, 100 milligram twice daily. There was no randomization. 89 patients had advanced SM. Uh, see, you can see the overall survival about somewhere around uh, 26 months for the entire group progression for survival was around 15%. But this uh, differed by subtypes. Although all subtypes responded, uh, survival, median survivals uh, changed. Aggressive systemic mastocytosis patients really enjoyed um, uh, being on the mitosterin, 60-70% patients survived. Um, the A SM and MCL patients, somewhere around three years uh, median survival. In this study, one of other things also, uh, the, the uh, in, not in this, yeah, mitosterin also showed that perhaps it decreased some uh, not in this study, but other studies, uh, symptoms, related symptoms in advanced F SM improved. And this was published in uh, Allergic Clinical Immunology Journal uh, last year. You can see the um, total scoring physical symptoms in shown in green, five psychological symptoms shown in uh, purple, and global distress index uh, decreased um in patients and physical health and mental health increase this is important because i'm going to mention about our pretty in um in indolent forms now our pretty uh, newer uh kit inhibitor uh the study in this publication the presentation um by dr radia uh, in at eha 2019 uh, you can see that 66 patients, uh, the patients were allowed to receive other therapies, including uh, uh, mitosterin before. Bone marrow burden was high, 50%, median serum triptase, median 182, and um, uh, median kit D816V allele fraction uh, was 16%. And you can see very good results here. System mastocytosis with AHN 
60 uh, percent survival at 33 months mcl is even better a, a greater than 80 percent and asm again uh, very good survival uh, uh, in this study that but there are side effects as expected and most of them are minor or not life-threatening except they notice intracranial bleeding in seven patients and the seven patients uh, had low platelet counts and then study was amended uh, if patients has less than 50,000 platelets they were not eligible for the study or they had to if it happens after uh, uh study started then they have to receive platelets or uh, have to find out or hold and hold the medication so low platelets in some patient cause um in, in uh, cns bleeding however when these changes may made regarding platelets or the patients receive more platelet transfusions this uh, intracranial bleeding did not occur again so the other risk uh, prognostic factor i i can tell you let's say you, someone is on midosterin you started using midosterin in a patient and you wonder if the patient has good prognosis on midosterin or not german group um, looked at it and found out some risk factors after six months if if after six months the the kit the eight v6 mutation um uh, eab the allergic burden decreased more than 25 percent they did well if decreases less than 25 percent they did not do well and also at the diagnosis if sar mutations were positive their overall survival also was not good on uh, in, on midosterin so you can the other drug a classical drug is cladribin uh, and you can see that uh, there are responses with cladribin and long-term uh, effects and side effects have been published uh, however here and there's no head-to-head -head comparison with kit inhibitors as expected however the german group look at cladribin versus midosterin smhn and you can see that using midosterin uh, made the um response in terms of in, 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 in the in terms of the kit allergic burden decrease much more if the patient receive midosterin compared with um uh cladribin and the kit responders like they showed in another study responded and survived better than uh not kit responders so we can think that perhaps midosterin prolonged survival better than cladribin because the patients with uh, midosterin had better uh uh kit allelic burden decrease higher um allelic burden decrease um however again this is this is not head-to-head -head comparison what about allogeneic stem cell transplantation we uh came together european and and uh colleagues from united states and collected about 60 patients data and we published in JCO about seven years ago now overall survival for all groups was somewhere around 60 percent uh, but it changed it changed by again the subgroup uh, SM AHN really enjoy uh, transplantation good outcomes 70 percent high 70 percent um, uh, survived the mcl patients did not benefit that much only uh, two out of seven patients survived and aggressive sm only 40 out of uh, 40 percent or so survived so the subtype affected the transplantation outcomes maybe myeloblative regimen did better than reduced intensity regimen um 
the sibling versus unrelated did not uh, make any difference. TBI versus non-TBI did not make significant difference. Obviously, in 60 patients, when you look at subsegments of patients, it is hard to make differences. What happens after transplantation? Can we use TKI? Yes, we can. This is my patient after allogeneic transplantation. This is serum triptase level significantly dropped from 3000s to you know, 2000s to all the way to uh, 800s, but started rising again. And, and we st I started midosterin and with midosterin decline very well. And this is not the only case. There is another case after transplantation, serum they started going up and they started midosterin. But, and this patient had SMMDS. So very interestingly, uh, the after transplantation, I will show you here, uh, they, and they look at different, follow this two population and this MDS population, SM population. So SM, MDS population uh, had TET2 mutation, KIT uh, SM population had KIT mutation. After transplantation, um, very MDS population responded and disappeared from the bone marrow. Uh, you can also see that TET2 mutation disappeared. And however, kit mutation continued and the mast cells continued. Then mitosterin reinitiated as a uh, uh, at post transplantation. See what happened. SM patient uh, population disappeared. Un unfortunately, three, four years later, MDS population reappeared. So patient relapse of MDS, and I believe the patient died. So very interesting. What we see is allogeneic transplantation has different effect SM and, and MDS population, but using a kit inhibitor, perhaps post-transplantation increases the success uh, of transplantation in SM. So today I, I get a lot of questions who should get transplantation, who shouldn't. To me, there are clear indications and clear no, no, no's, uh, clear ones to get transplantation. If AHN needs transplant like AML, obviously it is a no brainer that patients should get transplantation. If patient is receiving mitosterin or ovopiritinib and progressing, progression is AHN or is in uh, SM compartment. And obviously organ dysfunctions, they should get transplantation. Do not consider transplantation if they are uh, responding or, um, or uh, responding well, or at least PR and you can see in SM, then there's no reason to do transplantation. In my mind, obviously there is no um, uh, clear indications or contraindications, but you can imagine there is a big gray zone if patients inadequate response to the modern therapy, particularly effect uh, in this population, particularly the patient is young and fit and a donor is available. Shall we do transplant or not? But in this group, we have to consider response very seriously Look at the histopathology bone marrow, cerebrotriptase level, organomegalies, and and response by biomarker perhaps like the German group showed is that the kit allylic burden is going down or not, triptase response is going down or not, fifty percent at six months or alkaline phosphatase. So the evaluating the response, uh, very trying to be objective, and and. We also know that if patients have SAR mutations, generally they are SMAHM patients, we know that they will progress, more, uh, progression chance is more in those patients uh, on midosterin. We don't know yet with the avapiritinib what are the risk factors for progression. Okay, in the new era, now we know that uh, kit inhibitors have significant effect on patient survival with SM, uh, MCL, SM, AHN. Although SM, AHN still progresses, we have to be careful on them. Um, the, what about 
in the lung SM. They are not gonna die, but they have multiple, multiple, multiple symptoms in the lung SM. Can we use kit inhibitors? And here in the in this era, we are studying that. It's very, very exciting. The patients, the first initial results shown by Dr. Hartman in 2020 presented, you can see from fatigue, brain fog, flushing, spots, bone pain, itching, headache, abdominal pain, dizziness, nausea, diarrhea. Um, you can see two cur um, lines. One is straight, the other one is dotted. The, and you can see on the left-hand side, there is no change. But in the right hand side, uh, there's a big sh difference between two. There's a, some shrinking. And this, this is placebo. This is avapiritinib, 25 milligram. Avapiritinib in advanced SM is 200 milligram. So, so here, with the uh, lower dose avapiritinib, patient's symptoms improved in indolent SM. And obviously, the study is still ongoing. Uh, so we don't know it is still safe or, or effective. We cannot say that, but the initial uh, uh, results are promising. And not in, this is indolent SM. Not only symptoms get better, but also uh, uh, skin lesions, urticaria pigmentosa, uh, uh, get uh, less uh, with uh, avapiritinib. <clears throat> Same thing can also happen with midostern. So conclusions, we physicians, scientists, uh, industry, uh, obviously they brought this um, uh, drugs and, and financial support to do this prospective studies um, we, and patients, obviously patients that they, they took the risk and joined the prospective studies. And we have learned and we have been making giant steps in understanding of SM management of SM and prognostifications of SM. There are obviously now more treatment options with kit inhibitors and two of them were approved by FDA. And there are new kit inhibitors on top of it, new kit inhibitors are coming and in, uh, in the study phase in uh, studies with drug combinations like hypermethylating agents plus kit inhibitor mutations in SMAHN, SMCMML, SMMDS are needed. We don't know if the patient has SMCMML, how to treat, is it, is it mydosterin, avapiritinib, or it is um, decitabine or as a cytidine, or is a combination. Nobody knows. We need study to evaluate this. But I believe it's coming. We will see more. Um, studies and some case reports about this. Um, but this population, and it, this is the most common population in advanced SM, the treatment needs to be, uh, uh, we need to know about this population and we need to uh, know about its treatment. The studies are underway and in the now symptomatic patients in, in, in uh, like cutaneous mastocytosis, indolent SM, or monoclonal mast cell activation syndromes. Having said that, I will complete my uh, talk. Uh, thank you so much for your attention.